Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for, for coming and for uh, those of you who I don't know and those who are streaming from home. My name is Father Zach Swantek. I am the chaplain and director of the Aquinas Institute for Princeton Life. Uh, for Catholic life at Princeton University. And uh, it is uh, a great joy to be here to present on my dissertation topic. But first, by way of introduction, I feel it's also uh, marriage and family is not just something that I care about intellectually, but pastorally as a priest. Uh, I had, uh, when I was ordained in 2014, I was in a parish. Uh, then I went on for further studies and then went to serve primarily with young people uh, as a high school chaplain and as a college chaplain for several universities and since 2020 being in Princeton. And uh, this is a, a great joy working with young people, especially in the education of love following John Paul II and also having a great joy to celebrate uh, many marriages and not just be able to celebrate them, but to help young people prepare uh, for marriage. And in fact, uh, today is my parents' anniversary. It's their 49th anniversary, so it feels very providential to be able to, to speak about marriage today, seeing the great witness of their faithful love over the years. And speaking of uh, faithfulness, uh, part of that goes with uh, the studies that go into being a priest. If you didn't know that all priests need to have a bachelor's in philosophy or an equivalent of that. Now, I had already majored in English and religious studies when I was an undergrad. So when I started in seminary, my first two years was uh, completely focused on philosophy. Then we had four years to do a master's in theology. Normally a master's might take one or two years, but for a priest it takes four years because you need to train not only intellectually, but also pastorally, uh, spiritually, and on the human level. And so I remember when I was in seminary, one of my friends was an undergrad, and then she graduated, and then she did her master's and she graduated, then she started her doctorate and I thought, I've been here for five years already, now my sixth year. If I don't get a degree sometime soon, I'm going to be upset because you've already almost got three degrees. But eventually, yes, I did, um, after those six years, not only was I ordained, but had a master's in theology. And then after some pastoral experience, my bishop decided to send me back to Rome for a specialization in the theology of marriage and family at the John Paul II Institute. And with that, I got a degree that many of you might not have heard of called an STL, a licentiate. And so this was a, a, a great, it was just part one of a doctorate for a priest. And then eventually my bishop decided to send me back for more. Uh, for the licentiate, my licentiate topic was on suffering, sacraments, and healing in light of St. John Paul II's theology of the body. And then my bishop felt that I didn't get enough suffering writing that uh, thesis, so then he sent me back for more studies to complete the doctorate, but this time I did it on marriage as a healing sacrament, and especially on John Paul II and his call for a renewal of marriage preparation, but also in light of his theology of the body, but also of an obscure text of his 1960 retreat for engaged couples, which I will be getting into. This is John Paul II in October of 1995, here in New Jersey, uh, celebrating Mass. And for me, he is a saint who personally touched my life, being the Pope for most of my young life someone that I could see with my own eyes, and someone who I had the great privilege to be studying in Rome at his beatification and canonization, and so to see, be there at those masses as he uh, was declared a saint. And part of this, uh, when he was declared a saint by uh, Pope Francis, Pope Francis called him the Pope of the family, that the family and marriage preparation was on his heart, but this was not just something that he did as a pope, but he did throughout his life. And so we're going to get into that today. But I want to start with what was the problem that first initiated my doctoral dissertation and the work that I did. And it was this, the decline in sacramental marriage. I was shocked to see that over the last 50 years, there was a nearly 70% decline in the number of Catholics being married in the church. 
uh, with 426,000 sacramental marriages in 1970, but only 131,000 in 2020. And this is not being affected by COVID because the numbers are reported from the previous year. And so while the Catholic population had increased by 18 million, uh, the number of sacramental marriages had decreased significantly. And so this is a real tragedy. It's a real vocations crisis because it means that maybe some people are still getting married, Catholics are still getting married outside of the church, but they're missing out on the graces and the formation of and also the mission of what it means to be married within the church. And so Tim O'Malley uh, from Notre Dame had warned that sacramental marriage among the baptized in the church risks becoming a marginally practiced right in the next two generations as Americans' views on marriage, especially among emerging adults, continues to change. So I was very concerned with what is at the cause of this. Why is there this de massive decline in sacramental marriage? And you could say that there are many reasons for this. Some could say it's because of a sense of, uh, of selfishness and individualism. Some would say it's a loss of the sacramental meaning of things. Some could say this goes uh, back uh, to Occam, because we could blame like everything on him, and like going uh, uh, back to uh, all these different changes that have happened over time. But what I really pinpointed in my research was to recognize that I feel that the church has not adequately responded to the emergence of emerging adulthood, this new life phase uh, that has come about over the last 50 years due to changes uh, in our society. And what is emerging uh, adulthood, it's that now many uh, young adults put off enduring commitments like a settling into a career or getting married or having children. And so while in the past at some times people might settle in shortly after college or after high school into marriage and, some, uh, and an, into a job and buy a home, now for many reasons people might put that off. And this is neither good or bad, it's just a fact of life today that because of new education opportunities, many of you in fact will uh, be uh, continue your studies well into your 20s and sometimes into your 30s, uh, that you uh, may be moving from different jobs before you really settle down. And also for the fact that for God doesn't have one path for everyone. Not everyone is going to get married uh, at 22 right out of college, although some do. Some will put that off and some will be longing for marriage or still be discerning their vocations for a while. I know for me, I didn't feel called to be a priest until I was 28. So I was working in the business world and, and dating while uh, searching for and discerning my vocation. And so sometimes it takes time to mature and to figure that out. But there is a challenge that this new uh, life phase of emerging adulthood uh, brings to the church. And this is that with that, since many people are putting off these enduring commitments, that they are also delaying when they get marriage. Now the thing is that for many of us, when we think of marriage, we might think that marriage always was like it was in the 1950s and 1960s, with people getting married at a young age and starting a, a family very young. But in reality, this was, a, was uh, not the norm in our uh, American history. In fact, in the 1890s, uh, marriage was much later, for 26 for men and for 22 for women. So it was closer to what it is today. But then little by little, as people moved to cities, it started to go down. But then it got stuck for a while because of the Depression and then World War II, and certainly World War I as well. Uh, but then after World War II, there was this desire to return to normal. And so people were eager to get married, to start careers, and to start their lives. And also there was new economic and educational incentives that really fostered this for a short term. But then little by little, uh, the average age of marriage has been going up. So while 1960, we had the youngest time ever in American history that uh, people were getting married with 22.8 for men and 20 for women. Now we're at uh, one of the highest, at 30.5 for men and 28.1 uh, for women. And again, there's nothing 
necessarily bad about waiting uh, to get married. But the challenge is that this means that for many people and many young people, they're separated from the experience of love and family in their homes. Many will move out of their families' homes for college, and then after college and grad school and different careers and different things as they're starting their jobs, will have uh, a good number of years, whether it be five or ten or more, separated from that example of marriage and family life. And they might be immersed more in our culture, which is a hookup culture where uh, amidst many of their friends, they don't see that example of what true love and commitment means. Also for the church, uh, this uh, can be a danger because it seems to me that the pastoral approach in the past was they recognized that many young people as they went to college would kind of drift off and lose their faith for a little bit. But they said, don't worry, when they get married, they'll come back to the church. And then if they start having kids, then they'll want to have their kids baptized and come back to the church. But if people are putting off marriage, if they're putting off having uh, children, and so now it's not just drifting for four or five years in college, but it's 10 years or more, then there's a good chance they're never going to drift back. And plus, this isn't a good pastoral approach anyway. Uh, I think, as we see, it's wonderful to be involved in campus ministry in college and in grad school and grow in your faith, grow in community, maybe meet your future spouse. And uh, this, so it's a, a great opportunity here for us. But the church needs to adapt uh, into that to be able to minister to young people during these years so that it's not just t time where they're being formed by the culture, but where they're being formed by the church and through the witness and example of people who are truly living out their faith. And so St. John Paul II said, we need to have better uh, forms of marriage preparation, and we have to consider the actual challenges that we face today. And I think that this is one of those challenges. Because also, uh, this is many people are not getting married in the church, but people are getting married in the church. But from my experience, many of those who come to get married in the church are not practicing their faith regularly, don't have good catechesis, uh, often are uh, living in a lifestyle contrary to the moral teaching of the church. Uh, many are having sex outside of marriage, are living together, are using contraception. And so uh, they don't have an understanding of this. And so how do we respond to that? And for some priests, they're so happy that anyone wants to get married in the church that they just try to be really nice when people come to them for marriage. And they don't try to push anything. They don't try to challenge. And they say, maybe if I'm just really nice, they'll, they'll keep coming back to church after their wedding. But usually they don't see them ever again. On the other hand, some priests say, I refuse to marry you unless you follow the rules of the church. And they lay those out to people. But because it's been so contrary to everything that they've ever seen, sometimes even from their family and from their friends and from their culture, it could scare them away. And they say, fine, I'll get married on a beach. I don't need to get married in the church. Fine. And they uh, miss out on that too. But I think neither of these is a, a good approach. Instead, we need to see... Uh, marriage preparation is an opportunity to meet couples where they're at and then guide them into an encounter with Jesus Christ so that they can be lifelong apostles and then live out a flourishing marriage within the church and then serve in the mission through that sacrament in the church. And I think that in this way, marriage can be a truly healing sacrament that will provide healing to them and their wounded desires, the wounded example that many of them had growing up in their own families uh, of a marriage, because certainly none of us uh, grow up in a perfect home and with a perfect family. And then all of us have baggage, perhaps from past relationships and, uh, and breakups and different uh, experiences. So we need uh, this healing. So... Before we can talk about marriage as a healing sacrament, we need to know what is a sacrament. Sacraments are efficacious signs of grace, meaning they really have an effect on us, and they're instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is dispensed to us, where Jesus shares his own life to us. So 
Getting married in the church as a sacrament compared to not getting married in the church, it's not just like, okay, it does, what's the big difference? It's just like sprinkles on, on the ice cream. No, it's a, a real game changer and a difference because it has a real effect on us as we share in Christ's divine life. And the fruit of sacramental life is both personal and ecclesial on the church, as we'll see. It affects the individuals and the couple, but it also affects the whole church in their marriage. So why a healing sacrament? In the church, we have sacraments of initiation, of baptism, confirmation in the Eucharist. We have sacraments of healing, reconciliation, and anointing of the sick. And then we have sacraments in service of communion, marriage and holy orders. But why am I calling it a healing sacrament if that's not what the church does? Well, first, because the church says all of the sacraments bring us healing, because they bring us into communion with Jesus, who then is fruitful within us and shares his grace, his divine life with us. And that's what marriage is. It's a sign of a husband and wife uniting together and then being fruitful. So they point to that healing that comes through Christ. But even more than that, uh, that John Paul II says in Familiaris Consortio, willed by God in the very act of creation, marriage and the family are interiorly ordained to fulfillment in Christ and have need of his graces in order to be healed from the wounds of sin and restored to their beginning, that is to full understanding and the full realization of God's plan. So God wishes to give us the graces to heal us in our woundedness and our sins so that we're capable of living out his plan for marriage. Very often we might think of what Jesus says in the Bible or the teachings of the church as just impossible ideals that no one can reach. But instead to see that in, in, we can receive the graces to truly experience healing and to be able to live out that ideal. Now, yes, we'll always be the need, in need of healing. We'll be in need of God's mercy and forgiveness and reconciliation. So we don't need to be perfect in order to live out the sacraments, to be a priest, to be married, uh, whatever God is calling you to. But the sacraments are there to help us. And so... John Paul II says that Christian married couples and parents not only receive the love of God and become a saved community, but they are also called upon to communicate Christ's love to their brethren, thus becoming a saving community. And I think this is so important because I know for me, when I, before I discerned being a priest, when I thought about being married, the whole reason I wanted to be married was because I wanted to be happy. And I thought, well, this is what I need. If I want to be happy, someone has to love me. And I want to love, uh, give myself in love for another person. But I didn't recognize this as a true vocation that could bring uh, salvation to myself uh, and also could be uh, sharing in the church's mission of bringing saving uh, graces and healing to the culture around me. Again, I was just thinking about myself, what's in it for me. But remember... Uh, that uh, marriage and uh, holy orders are in service of communion. They're meant to bring about communion and healing to the church and to the world. So it's not just about us. It's always about uh, giving our, of ourselves for the good of another and through that finding happiness and fulfillment. And so this truly struck me the, that marriage and family is a saved community, but also a saving community. There's healing uh, for the couple, and especially their wounded desires and for their sins, but there's also healing through the couple to the culture and to the world around them. And we'll see that even more. But this is united with the identity and mission of the family. St. John Paul II says, the family finds in the plan of God, the creator and redeemer, not only its identity, what it is, but also its mission, what it can and should do. Family, become what you are. And I, I love that, become what you are. It's something I say to myself every day to try to live out my vocation more and more. But what is a family? Well, he says, the identity is a community of life and love. This union of husband and wife that images God's love as a trinity and then Christ's love for the church. But its mission is to guard, reveal, and communicate love 
And this is a living reflection of and a real sharing in God's love for humanity and the love of Christ the Lord for the church, his bride. And so, through the sacrament of marriage, we'll, as we'll see, the husband and wife not only are a sign of Christ's love for the church, but they actually participate in that. And so they're strengthened, healed, purified, and elevated so that they can live out this identity and mission. And so what I want to do with the rest of the talk is show that as I, was, as I started my dissertation, I was only going to focus on John Paul II's theology of the body, man and woman, he created them. But I found this wonderful text, Budavach Domna Scale, uh, which is John Paul II, before he was Pope in 1960, his retreat for engaged couples that had never been, been translated into English. And I said, I have to read this. And so I read it, I translated it, and I was amazed because, as we'll see, there's so many connections with what John Paul II says later, but then can help show how to use this in a pastoral sense to see that what he's writing is not just abstract theology. Sometimes people will say about uh, John Paul II, well, Theology of the Body is a great book for a celibate priest to write, but he doesn't know anything about marriage uh, in reality. As we'll see, this is far from true. Uh, and so I want to show you uh, what I felt is that if we want to truly understand the renewal of marriage, we don't just read his words as Pope, but we can look first at his approach to uh, marriage preparation, then the context in this retreat, and then the application, which will bring it all together. So first, the context, the approach of Karol Wojtyła, who was born in uh, 1920 in Wadowice, Poland. Uh, in 1938, he started college in Krakow, not far from where he grew up, at the Jagiellonian University, where he studied philology and was an actor and a playwright and a poet. But in his sophomore year of college, uh, in September, the Nazis invaded Poland, the university was shut down, the... Uh, all the professors were sent to concentration camps and killed, and he uh, was forced into uh, labor, working uh, at a stone quarry and then uh, at a chemical plant. And during that time, he uh, found or um, joined a group called the Living Rosary, uh, led by a, a man in his parish, Jan Tiranowski, who uh, taught him and many other young people in the parish how to pray, how to grow in their spiritual life, uh, devotion to Mary, and a love of the writing of the Spanish mystics, St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila. And during that time, he, as he prayed and he saw the horrors of World War II and so many people being killed around him, his heart was in instead turned to the love of God and feeling that he was being called, like so many others, to give of himself for the good of society and for the good of the world, but his way was to give of himself by becoming a priest. So he, at the time, the seminary was shut down. It was illegal to be a seminarian, and if they caught you, you were killed. But he joined a secret clandestine uh, seminary, and then in 1945, the war was over, and in November 1st, 1946, he was ordained uh, a priest. And... Uh, Right after, a week after he was ordained a priest, he was sent to Rome to go on to do his uh, doctorate. And there he wrote his doctorate on faith according to St. John of the Cross under the great Thomistic scholar, Father Reginald Garrigou Lagrange. And so, uh, first thing to know about Karl Wojtyla, John Paul II, is that he is deeply rooted, uh, first of all, in, in Aquinas and Thomism, but also through St. John of the Cross that he wants to relate the objective and the metaphysical to, uh, to the pastoral or to our real lived experience. And he felt that through the poetry of John, uh, St. John of the Cross, he, he really saw a connection there with his own uh, desire to connect the metaphysical with reality. So he came back uh, after two years and finishing his doctorate, he came back to Poland. Uh, in 1948 and was assigned for just less than a year to uh, a rural parish in Nigowitz, uh, and where he got deeply involved in the lives of his parishioners and in family life. But his bishop had 
bigger plans for him, so he brought him into Krakow and assigned him to St. Florian's Church, uh, just outside of the center of the old town. There was already a, uh, a priest in charge of campus ministry to the universities there, but uh, there were enough universities that they felt, okay, we need to expand our campus ministry, even though it was a, now under uh, the communist occupation, it was illegal to organize groups of students uh, together. So he had to find ways to reach out to them in a unique way. So he started going to their dorms, to their apartments, and to invite them to come to the church for mass. They could do that. And then to say, afterwards, on Thursday night, we're going to have a, a gathering like we have for grad fellowship where I'm going to talk to you about the existence of God. I'm going to talk to you about it, what, it, what it means to be created in the image of God. And you, uh, you'll be able to grow in your faith from that. And at first, he was very difficult to understand, but the people really connected with him. They saw that he was authentic, his love of God and his prayer life. And so uh, he continued to invite them and then to get involved in their lives, to go with them to celebrate their birthdays and their names days, to celebrate when they finished exams, to go to plays together, to go um, uh, and uh, go out together and to eat together and to really get into their life. And I'll cover that more. But in those two years there, it really became his immersion into their life. Uh, and during that time, he celebrated 229 baptisms and 160 weddings. That's a lot of weddings. And this is just in two years. This would continue after that. But just to give an idea that here at St. Florian's, he, not, he started the first marriage preparation program in Poland. That before then, it was just to fill out some paperwork and then uh, celebrate the wedding. But here, he felt they needed to be adequately prepared for marriage, and so he began meeting with the couples and then inviting them to meet with doctors, with psychologists, and with others who could help better explain uh, mar marriage li marital life to them. And through uh, celebrating Mass for them, by uh, hearing confessions, he came to learn from the inside by hundreds and thousands of couples about their life. So while many married couples know about their marriage, he knew about thousands of marriage and was, and was able to live uh, or learn from their lived experience. Now, after those two years, he got a new bishop who decided that he needed a second doctorate. And so he was asked to do that at the Jagiellonian University. And he said this was a real cross for him. He said this meant I would have uh, less time for pastoral work that's so dear to me. This was a sacrifice, but from that time on, I was always resolved that my dedication to study of theology and philosophy would not lead me to forget that I was a priest, but rather would help me become one ever more fully. And this is what he did. Even while doing his doctorate, he continued to do campus ministry and to work with young people and university students. And then after he finished his doctorate, uh, he uh, would continue that on until he was made a bishop. I know that I feel the same way, that uh, these last few years, I'm sorry I haven't been available enough to you, I haven't been working hard enough, uh, because I've always had work to do on my dissertation, but now that it's done, I'm ready to throw myself even more fully into my ministry to each of you. So he was uh, assigned to teach at the Catholic University of Lublin in eastern Poland near Ukraine. Uh, and there's me just, uh, with an epic beard uh, there uh, uh, teaching or pretending to teach where he had taught. But he would take the train to go there each week, but then he would go back to Krakow where he was, as a priest, continued his ministry. And he did this until 1958 when he was made a bishop at the young age of 38. And then uh, he never stopped ministering to young people, but as a bishop, he started to have more responsibilities. Uh, uh, and, then, uh, and then in 1964, he would become archbishop. In 1967, uh, a cardinal. And then in 1978, uh, the pope. And as he became bishop, he would expand his marriage preparation to the whole diocese and then to all of Poland and then as pope throughout the whole world. But I still feel that much of what uh, John Paul II had sought to do has not been realized yet in the church. So we're still living that out and we want to see that. Uh, just another thing about his, his approach was this 
one of the key things was he thought that people needed an adequate environment to be able to grow in their capacity for love. This is called Shrodovisko. This is his group of young people who would gather together uh, to uh, spend time with him, go to mass with him, and learn from him, and learn from each other uh, about uh, love and marriage and family. And Here's me in those same mountains, uh, bringing young people, as I do each summer, to do the same, to walk in his footsteps and learn about love, marriage, and family. And then here, he would go uh, hiking with them, skiing, uh, kayaking, and bicycling. And he, would, uh, he said that a priest should accompany young people in all things except for sin. And so that he would uh, be involved in every aspect of their, their lives uh, and to be able to celebrate with them, but also to mourn with them in times of difficulty, and then to truly learn from them. And at the, uh, the key aspect, the center of all of their time together was the Mass. Here is a painting in St. Florian's of him as a priest, and behind him he is a kayak that, they, that he would celebrate Mass on uh, uh, outside, like after, not on the water, but getting out and then uh, turn it upside down and celebrate Mass on there for the people as they were kayaking and hiking together. And as they this was perfect for him because, remember, they weren't allowed to have gatherings in the church, so he would go out with them uh, out uh, into uh, these places to go hiking and mountain climbing and kayaking, and it would give him a chance to be able to, outside of the church, to minister to them in a natural way. And so... John Paul II said that young people want their love to be beautiful. And as a young priest, he really fell in love with human love, with romantic love. And he said that it's necessary to prepare young people for marriage. It's necessary to teach them love. Love is not something that is learned, and yet there is nothing else as important to learn. So unfortunately, you can't just take a course at Princeton and then say, okay, I know how to learn, I'm ready to get married, who wants to marry me? No. Uh, that is, it is something we need to learn, uh, but it's not something learned in that way in a class. But he felt one way was through that environment of being able to be in a community with friends and seeing what it means to love and be loved. And the other aspect of it is that accompaniment by guides the priests, and other married couples who would be able to witness to younger people uh, what it means to, uh, to love and to be married. Now, in 1960, so when he's been uh, bishop for two years, he came out with a book called Love and Responsibility, a famous philosophical work in which he outlines uh, what it means uh, to truly uh, love and to grow in our capacity for love. And this was based on his lectures at the Catholic University of Lublin. Cool. And so, and this where he would bring his manuscript of this to, with him, uh, uh, with camping with everyone, and they would read it around the uh, fire and go over it. And so it came from this lived experience. Now that same year, he published a play called The Jeweler's Shop, in which he looked at three couples and their struggles with, with uh, marital love. And so seeing that he didn't want to just uh, understand marriage philosophically, but also he wanted to see it in the drama of human love and through that interaction. But that same year is when he came out with his, or when he had this retreat for engaged couples. And so this was amazing to me. Three important writings on marriage and family in the same year, and that as I read through them, I saw that there were many words that were the same, many phrases that were the same, but just used in different ways depending on the audience, whether philosophy or drama or preparing actual people for marriage. And so I was so excited as I was writing the dissertation because I just wanted to like do all the connections possible. And then to show later as Pope, he didn't forget all this, but just deepened it all the more. And uh, as we will see. My struggle today is that I went overboard and wanted to show you, I knew I couldn't show you everything, but wanted to show you some of the things that I found, and even that might be too much, but we'll see. So let's get into the content of this retreat for engaged couples that I hope to get Vatican approval for so that then we can publish it in English and that all of you can enjoy it as well. But uh, if not for now, just take a seminar with me and we'll do it that way. Uh, so... His, this retreat was given at the Collegiate Church of St. Anne. This was the center of campus ministry in Krakow, and it was done December 19th to the 21st in 1960. This is inside the church. 
And here it has, it's three meditations. So for three days, he gave these spiritual exercises or this retreat uh, to them. And in the first meditation was called to swear to the truth before God. And in the introduction to this, he starts out by saying, we prepare ourselves for sacraments with catechesis. You prepare for your first communion by taking religious education class. Same with confirmation. So why would we expect it to be any different for marriage? That marriage, we need catechesis. We need to understand what we're doing when we're entering into sacramental marriage. And so he says, it's obvious that the sacrament, in a certain sense, projects its light on all of married life, and that in preparing for the sacrament, we are indirectly preparing ourselves for the whole of married life. And then he says, the sacrament of matrimony is the introduction to married life. It is the threshold of this life. If we cross the threshold well, then it is very likely that also the successive path of marital life will unfold favorably. Now, many... For many young people, they become so focused on preparing well for the wedding day and for the wedding celebration, but not for actually understanding what marriage is and what sacramental marriage is. So his thesis in his retreat is if we can understand what sacramental marriage is, so therefore the couple understands their identity and then their mission within the church and the graces available to them, then they will better live out their marriage. But most people just think, okay, I, I get, I, like, I know what marriage is, uh, but many of us still have that consumeristic worldview uh, that we might catch from the culture or not fully understand it. And so... He said, these catechesis are dictated from a deep concern for the needs of our time and particular trials uh, that we face. And so what are these? For him, certainly it was communism, which was doing everything in its part to undermine sacramental marriage and to undermine the time that uh, married couples had with each other and with their families and also scheduling work so that it would become nearly impossible to participate in the life of the church. But it was more than that. Two years before this retreat in 1958, he laments about baptized unbelievers, that so many people, he said, in Poland, which is shocking, because uh, like, uh, to think then, before Vatican II, in a country that even now has a high level of like, marriages and sacramental life, but saying even then he recognized this danger of saying that for many of them, they don't understand uh, the what sacramental marriage is, so they're not availing uh, themselves of the graces of the sacrament, not to mention of the Eucharist, of reconciliation, and other sacraments. And so he said the crisis of the institution is not so much a question of avoiding evil as it is above all of fully extracting the good that can be achieved in marriage thanks to the fact that it's a sacramental institution. So this goes back to what I said before. So often we might be focused on, okay, here's the things you should shouldn't be doing before marriage, but instead uh, focusing, this is what marriage really is, and inviting people into it where they say, oh, I don't want to do these things because it will hurt my marriage. It will hurt my capacity to make a full gift of myself, not because they were just told not, uh, not to by a priest or by the church. And so what amazed me is that his whole retreat is focused on the vows of marriage. And so this... Uh, is uh, very important of, he said, but just by going through the liturgy of the sacrament of matrimony, it helped him unpack for them the meaning of it so that it would give them more meaning for when they got married sacramentally. And so here he gives the, the vows uh, in 1960, which are a little bit different from today, but basically the same. Uh, I take you to be my wife or husband, and I vow to you love, faith, and honor in marriage, and to not abandon you until death. And then this is the part that we don't have anymore. Help me, O Lord, God Almighty, one in three with all the saints. Uh, which is a real shame in a sense because it's really recognizing we're calling on God for his help uh, and uh, all the saints uh, in that. But we do mention when the husband and, and wife exchange their ri rings, they say, take this, sign, uh, take this ring as a sign of my love and fidelity in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So there is this invocation of the Trinity and later throughout the ceremony, but not in the vows themselves. But the key aspects being faithful, love, and honor, that is in there, and that's what he's really focused on in the retreat. And so he says that here in marriage, we're speaking these vows before God, 
And this changes everything. Because you can say something in front of your friends, in front of your family, but to say it in front of God is calling on the greatest weight and the greatest witness to this. But what is it that you're asking God to witness? To the sincerity that I really feel this way? I really feel love? Or the authenticity of our will? And the answer is of our will. That because feelings will come and go and will change throughout time. And so there will be times and days where couples might feel that deep sense, a profound sense of love, and other days that are more of a struggle. But the will of saying, I will the good of the other, I choose to give of myself for their good, that is what becomes unchanging, to keep that on so that God becomes a witness to these words. And though they're only pronounced once, it has an impact on the whole rest of their marital life, of living out the vows that they speak on their wedding day. And that's why I encourage couples so often to pray with those vows before they say them, so they're not just words given to them by the church, but that they truly resonate with them and will stick with them the rest of their life. Now, then he points out, who is the minister of the sacrament of marriage? That in any of the other sacraments, it's the priest, or the deacon, and it's Jesus is working through the priest or deacon to communicate grace, because it's really Jesus who is baptizing, it's really Jesus who is celebrating Mass or forgiving sins, but it's through the minister. And, but in marriage, uh, the priest doesn't marry the couple, but they marry each other through the words that they speak and through the gift of themselves, of their bodies to each other in marriage. They are the ministers of the sacrament, not just on their wedding day, but for every day for the rest of their life, where they are able to communicate grace to each other. And so he says, be attentive to what you do, because they are the sacrament itself. They're the sacrament and they're the ministers of the sacrament. The witness is the priest on behalf of Christ, and then the best man and maid of honor on behalf of the church, and then united with the whole congregation and all the family and friends who are, visit, who are, who are there to witness the marriage. And so this is important to recognize too. If you go to weddings, that you're there as a witness, not just to see it happen, but to pray for them and to pray for them and support them throughout their life. And then Lastly, in this first section, he says, to implore the grace of God for a lifetime, that these words help me, is an invocation as God as a witness, but also a supplication asking for God's grace. And that God, Jesus, instituted marriage with the purpose, with a plan to help us by giving us his grace to be able to carry it out. And so this is how we can be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, not on our own, but only through the grace of God that he wishes to give us through the sacraments. And so in the jeweler shop, for example, he says, the thing is that love carries people away like an absolute, although it lacks absolute dimensions. But acting under an illusion, they do not try to connect that love with a love that has such a dimension. They do not even feel the need, blinded as they are, not so much by the force of their emotion as by the lack of humility. They lack humility toward what love must be in its true essence. The more aware they are of it, the smaller the danger. Otherwise, the danger is great. Love will not stand the pressure of reality. Marriage is hard. Uh, it is hard to live out marriage, but on our own. It's beyond our capacities, especially because we're sinful and we have the, the inclination to sin, concupiscence. But marriage is thought of as a remedy for concupiscence. It brings healing to us so that even with that, we can be able to be healed if we connect it to God, this absolute dimension. Now, in the second meditation, is on love and faithfulness to the end, where now he's going to meditate on what does it mean to love at, with love and faith, with fidelity, with faithfulness. And so he says this bears with it trust and that uh, he says, in marriage, we need to be ambitious, that we have not only the right, but the need to be ambitious in marriage uh, by giving of ourselves. But we must be mature to the point that a person can say, I can count on myself to do this. And then, which involves this growth in capacity of being able to say, I want to be a person on whom you can count on in life. He says, this is a long process of growth and maturity of each of the spouses growing in accurate knowledge of each other. 
So the point is, how long do people need to be dating or to be engaged in order to be prepared for marriage? There's no set time, but it's a sense of growing in maturity and growing in accurate knowledge of each other to be able to know their strengths, but also their weaknesses so that you're not marrying an ideal or pretending that you're perfect, but instead you're ready to give of yourself knowing your own weaknesses and knowing the weaknesses of the other. He says, uh, we cannot have confidence unless you can, you can respect a person highly, but to have faith in them, to count on him for your whole life requires more. It's therefore something that one arrives after a long process, a process of knowledge. So coming to know ourself and then coming to know uh, the other. He says something similar in Love and Responsibility. It's a beautiful quote, but I'll just cut to the heart of it, of saying that uh, the greatness of love is manifested the most when a person fails, when his weaknesses or even sins come to light. One who truly loves does not refuse his love, but in a sense loves even more. He loves while being conscious of deficiencies and vices without, however, approving them, for the person himself never loses his essential value. And so this means that we are, are uh, committed to the value of the person, which never changes. There might be times within a marriage, within a relationship, where someone uh, is struggling with uh, different things, but to r always go back to the person and to keep constancy in that love, also being able to forgive and ask for forgiveness. Next, he addresses the indissolubility of marriage, noting that, quoting, the priest says, quoting from Jesus in the Bible, that what God joins together, let no one put asunder. So it's God who unites a couple in marriage. So there is no possibility of divorce when, uh, when marriage is valid because they've been joined by God, not by human beings. And he says there's two reasons for this. This, by the way, is just a photo of me in Krakow with some of the students that I brought there, and we're performing the jeweler shop outside of a jeweler shop where they filmed the movie The Jeweler Shop. Uh, so uh, we wanted to be authentic there. And there I am presenting them the rings. But uh, here, indissolubility, first of all, it's concern for the children who have a right to their parents. Of course, uh, parents can die, there can be reasons, but uh, that in God's plan for marriage and family that it's so that through the love of husband and wife, of um, father and mother can witness to the love of God to the child, and especially through their indissolubility, it witnesses to God's faithfulness to us. And so without that, it cannot witness to that. But also in consideration of human love, that he says that if you allow for divorce, this would be a trampling on the humanity of the, of the, the persons. And these are, are the strong words, because he, I found several other times when John Paul II uses this exact phrase, and it's always about the Nazis and what they did to people, uh, to the Jewish people and to others uh, in concentration camps, this trampling on our humanity, so that he would use the same of what this happens to us uh, when we promise this to be to love and be faithful and honor, but then to uh, take back that promise, to see that being united in the love of God, we need God to strengthen us there. And so here in Love and Responsibility, he talks about how a love is not something ready-made, but something that's just given, but it's something that's entrusted. It never is, but it's always becoming, meaning that if you're dating and you start feeling love for each other, you don't think, okay, all we got to do is keep everything exactly how it is uh, and like on day one of our marriage and then we'll be good. And you're like, oh, 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 I lost it. No. Instead, like love is something that's continually meant to be growing. It needs our work every single day. It's not something that you just lose, but it's something that needs, it's, there's a material for love that needs to be built upon. And this comes through reciprocity and the common good. But the enemies to this are immature sentiments, uh, where often where we just have a strong feeling of love, a strong sense of love, or egoism. Again and again and again in the writings of John Paul II, I was surprised to see how much he focuses on egoism, on selfishness. But it makes sense because we cannot make a gift of ourself to others if we're only thinking of our, ourself and what we're getting from, from others. And so... He makes this warning about immature sentiments also in the jeweler shop, saying that love must be our weight, the weight of the whole fate. It can't just be a single moment. That we're, It's easy to think for a moment, like, okay, I could love this person, but to love them throughout their life. As I said, my parents today 
celebrate 49 years of marriage. Uh, there's been many uh, good times and bad, and especially as they get older, there's new challenges that they face, but it's that fidelity until the end, until they fulfill their mission to get both spouses and their kids to heaven. Uh, so there it is. And so in order to create this reciprocity, they need to be focused on the common good, which is defined by their marital vows, not just thinking about my good and your good, but us and our good at all times, which happens through reciprocity, through the mutual gift of self by each spouse. So not I take from you and you take from me, but I give to you. Uh, I'm not I possess you, but I belong to you. I give myself over to you. And he, so John Paul II says, ultimately, love needs to be more than a sentiment or a feeling. Uh, it needs to be a virtue. It needs, if it's going to be something that we can construct marriage on with a solid foundation. And so what does it mean that love grows, that reciprocity grows, that comprehension grows, the desire for the common good, and the common creation of this life grows? And in Love and Responsibility, he just outlines these kind of four points of what it means as love as a virtue. Our last meditation is on conjugal honor. And so he says, what does it mean to pledge, what does it mean to honor a person? Well, in a unique way in marriage, you're honoring each other by giving of your whole self, including your body, to the other person. And that means honoring them by not using them as an object, but recognizing them as a gift and honoring their fertility as well. So he says that honoring them takes in mind the ends of marriage, which are three, the procreation and education of children, reciprocal help, and a remedy for concupiscence. Now, after Vatican II, the language has changed, even though not denying these three ends of marriage. But now there's a more of a focus on the two meanings of marriage, the unitive meaning and um, the procreative meaning, or the fr fruitful meaning that these two go together. You can't have one without the other. And it's the same with these, that sometimes people misunderstand when you say the first end of marriage is procreation. They think that means that's the most important thing is having children uh, with marriage. But John Paul II says the real end of marriage is supernatural. It's sharing Christ's life and getting to heaven. Each of these participate in this, but when we talk about ends or the uh, telos, uh, the, the reason for this, the, the goal, that it's ordered in this way because it's the first Procreation is the first thing that distinguishes marriage from all other relationships, from all other friendships. It's a unique friendship that involves not just creating new life, but also educating that uh, life so that they would grow in maturity to, God willing, go to Princeton, and then even more, God willing, uh, go to get to heaven. Uh, but secondly, it involves the reciprocal help, that the spouses do this together as to grow to not just be spouses, but to be parents. And then through this, it's a remedy of concupiscence. But the remedy of concupiscence, we can misunderstand this as just being like, it's a way to have sex validly that the church approves. But that's not what that is. The remedy for concupiscence is not just in our sexual life, but in our whole life of being able to be freed from disordered desires, uh, our selfishness, our ego, and to be able to make a true and reciprocal gift of self. And so John Paul II foresees what will happen at the Second Vatican Council and uh, Paul VI Humanae Vitae by recognizing that these ends need to be subordinated to one another, that especially the third end must be subordinated to the second and to the first, and to see that, uh, yes, that he says that sexual life is a good thing uh, in marital love. And that within this, uh, we, uh, it, for part of that reason, because we can participate with God in the creation of new life. And so that, but not only creating new life, but for a, a husband and wife to mature to become a father and a mother. That strikes me as well, the way his language is of saying that whenever a couple engages in the marital act, they should keep in mind that I may become a parent in this, that I, not I might have children, but I might be coming, being called by God right now to become a father or a mother, or to actually be a father and a mother in this moment, so cooperating with God. But that there are times when a couple is not ready for those children, and this can be a time of continence, of periodic abstinence, that they don't have to always have sex, they can, uh, uh, take a break and find other ways to express that marital intimacy in those times when they're not ready to accept children, but 
They should always be praying for that openness. And this should lead to a spiritual and physical unity between the couple, which then spreads out to not just to their life as a married couple, but also honor extends throughout their family to their children as well. And then he ends this meditation talking about the sacrament of sacrificial love, recognizing, first of all, that the wedding rings are a sign that they're now one flesh, and so they're their existences are their earthly existence is welded together that they can no longer just think of themselves but they always must consider the other and then also their children and then in polish custom when the couples make their vows together they wrap the stole of the priest around their their hands uh, as to the sign that they are the ministers of the sacrament and that there's something priestly in what they're doing he says uh, that it's a part marriage is a participation in Christ's priesthood in his sacrifice as i've said at every single wedding that i've celebrated marriage if if the central image in the bible of marriage is Christ giving of himself for his bride, the church, on the cross, then marriage is like a slow crucifixion. And not because marriage is so awful and painful, but because we constantly have to die to self and offer of ourselves in sacrifice for a spouse and for the children. And so he says, I beg you to prepare yourself in a religious way, not to approach it superficially. And he says, God must give you the grace. Uh, both when you speak the words and later throughout your whole life, especially in those most difficult times. So implore God so that what is pronounced with the mouth becomes truly the foundation of your life. Amen. That the vows are something that they can, couples can meditate on again and again and again to go deeper into this, uh, into the meaning of their marriage. I'll just close now with an application uh, where in my dissertation I go certainly much more in depth on how to really show why uh, what in the interim when people emerging adults are not married the dangerous things that they do that thwart their capacity for for a marriage but now in marriage preparation it, the couple can truly be a saved community that as John Paul II says needs a, a good environment where they can see the witness of love of married couples in the parish in their community and also through the accompaniment of priests and other married couples. And normally he, he lays out three stages. The remote preparation comes from our own family life. But for many, as I said, our family life might not adequately prepare us. Also, the proximate preparation is when we learn about the sacraments. But many of us might not have had proper religious education growing up. And so then immediate preparation is preparing for the wedding. But now that might be a time to do more of all of these things. And so he's, as we saw in his retreat, the first thing that we need is catechesis. Catechesis helps us to bring out the full meaning of marriage. So this is important that uh, in I mean, a best time to start preparing for marriage is before you're even dating, because now you can learn about marriage and prepare yourself so that when you uh, meet that person, you can better give of yourself for that. But if not within marriage preparation, you need the cate catechesis to learn the significance of the sacrament. Secondly, the liturgy can be a place where we truly learn. St. John Paul II says, the whole liturgy of the sacrament of matrimony is worthy of serious reflection since it so clearly accentuates the connection between making a gift of oneself and offering a spiritual sacrifice. In the liturgy, we see Christ saying, this is my body given for you in the Eucharist for us, his bride, and then we unite with him sacramentally. And for a moment, we experience that mystical marriage that we'll experience fully in heaven. Well, married couples do the same because in the sacrament, they become a visible sign of Christ's love for the church through uh, their words that they speak and through the matter. They are the matter of the sacrament. They, it's through themselves, their words, and then through their body, through their gift of themselves. And so they need to live out that sign because they are a sign of the covenant, of the abiding reality of, through their conjugal bond, the second effect that the sacrament of marriage has, once they speak those words in the wedding ceremony, they're now one flesh. And now they have become a sacrament so that people can see them and say, now I understand Christ's love for the church, the way that Abby and Zach love each other here in their wedding, that they are... That is how we, Christ loves the church, because they are a sign of Christ's love uh, for the uh, church. And then third, 
Couples receive the grace. It's the sacramental effect that they have. And the grace is of this healing, the healing of concupiscence. It's the grace to be able to fully give of themselves, and, and it's to uh, be able to resist the temptations that they will face. The right itself, this is what John Paul II did for his marriage preparation, is what I do with couples of go through the right to understand better. That first the readings where are uh, at the wedding mass are there to help us to immerse ourselves in God's love story so we can better understand how through marriage we participate in God's love story so that everybody who attends the wedding can renew their own sense of God's love. It's then through the vows themselves, to be, uh, before they make the vows, they are asked, do you come here freely, totally, and uh, wholeheartedly, without coercion? Uh, do you promise to be faithful to one another? And you open the children and raising them in the church. These things of free, uh, faithful, total, and fruitfulness in their marriage. Uh, and so that they can better understand what that means so that they can then live it out. And then in the nuptial blessing in uh, the Mass, you know, the priest... Uh, through the epiclesis, calls down the Holy Spirit on the gifts of bread and wine and transforms it into Christ's living body, blood, soul, and divinity. Well, later in the marriage uh, ceremony, after the Our Father, he calls down the Holy Spirit again, but this time on the married couple, giving them a participation in, in God's salvation story with us to be able to give them the grace to uh, get to heaven uh, and to bring their children to heaven as well. And so the right becomes a place where every time we go to a marriage and see it celebrated, but also through preparing for it, it helps them. And then not only as a saved community, but now as a saving community, they live out their identity as a community of life and love, especially through the common good. The good of the couple is not just turned inwards, where they're just say, okay, I, we've got each other and this is all we need. But instead, that love is meant to be fruitful first in with their children in their home, but then beyond that to others as well, which goes into their mission to guard, reveal, and communicate love. And they do this by living out their baptismal identity as priest, prophet, and king, but now in a new way. Whereas priests, they offer sacrifice to uh, for each other through every act of marriage, from the most mundane to the most sublime, from doing the dishes to the marital act. All of this can become a way of worshiping God and fulfilling their mission as a prophet to be, give witness to the world of Christ's love, which is free, total, faithful, and fruitful, Christ's love for the church, and uh, to be able to do that in word and deeds. And then as a king, to be able to honor each other, to be able to uh, honor uh, their marital and family life through that total gift of self. And so... Uh, I know this might have been a bit overwhelming to you. For me, it was like only about like one fifth of what I would love to say about the dissertation, but you know, there's limits. So uh, thank you. And I just want to say that it's funny, when I first started writing this, many, many times I have been invited to give talks at young adult groups and in Theology on Tap on this, but I hadn't even written my dissertation yet, so I had given it uh, many times, so now it was a bit different uh, uh, talking about it, but the, the, to me, the most... Uh, the, most beautiful thing has been the writings of John Paul II. They're worth really reading, pondering, and meditating on. It will help you grow in your understanding of yourself, of God, and of love and vocation. So I encourage that. Do we have any questions? Yes, Paul. Um, Father, thank you so much for your, um, your talk. You know... I feel like this this talk really filled me with a lot of hope in terms of the um, the things which marriage points to and the essence of it as well. But I think we all know that um, often marriage is, is really quite difficult. Um, and I, I'm sure all of us are familiar with or have friends with, or perhaps we ourselves have um, parents who are divorced or who have really um, difficult or fraught relationships. And I just wonder if you could say something to um, that reality of after this beautiful sacrament, which is setting us up for success, um, when distrust comes into a marriage or 
um, perhaps infidelity or perhaps whatever it might be. Um, what is kind of the, the, is there a way out of that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and, and this, uh, what John Paul II uh, offers here for couples is, yes, I, as we acknowledge, witnessing that marriage really is difficult, and God realizes this and so wants to give us the graces to be able to live that out. And so how much we uh, are dependent on those graces. So it's not just, again, of simply following the rules of the church, because there are many young people who have nothing... Uh, they sincerely desire to do that, to do what the church is asking of them. And they do that as they enter into their marriage. But as marriage goes on, they face many of those difficulties, many of those things that were unexpected and unplanned, which can be, you know, losing a job, getting sick. It can, like, many different things that are just normal parts of life that can be very challenging. And then sometimes it can be the sinfulness uh, of the spouses and uh, those struggles. But in all of that, of, I think what John Paul II wants to stress of not doing this alone, of truly availing oneself of the graces that comes from offering oneself as a sacrifice in Mass and receiving grace from that, of availing of ourself of the sacrament of reconciliation, of confession, because this way of getting ourselves right with God and experiencing healing so that that can now be communicated to one's spouse and to one's family and truly praying for each other and praying together as well. And I think with that of re remembering that in this promise of fidelity to each other, this isn't a burden placed on them of saying like, oh, yeah, I'm stuck with this person, but instead the great joy of being opened up of now uh, saying, uh, we can have true intimacy because I realize this person, we're one. They're not going anywhere. I can say, point out to them, hey, I don't know wh why you're doing this, uh, but this needs to change. It needs to be fixed. Or I'm struggling. I need your help. Uh, and Or I need your forgiveness. And so I think this is important to have that true openness and communication and uh, to not lose sight of that. And to ask for the help of others, too, uh, of other couples who, who can be of help. But I think there's, uh, again, it's that continual renewal, that love is nothing, never something that's ready-made, but constantly always becomes. And so it needs to be reaffirmed each day. And I live that out all the time in my fidelity as a priest. Like, it seemed like Promising to be a priest for the rest of my life seemed very easy until the rest of my life. And it's like, oh, this is longer than I thought it would be. Uh, like that, uh, uh, because, yes, I, I want to be truly a priest for the rest of my life, but not knowing what things would come up later. And I'll just say one other thing there is that he brings out is uh, of recognizing on their wedding day, he says in the retreat, they give their entire future to God. They put their entire future on the altar. And then God gives it back to them now, infused with his grace, so that now there's nothing to fear of saying, like, yes, it, by being married in the church, by receiving the sacrament, it doesn't promise you everything's going to be easy. But it does promise you God's fidelity and that God will be with you. And so uh, that can help the couple in good times and bad and sickness and health to come to God uh, for help. Thank you. Um. <laughs> Thank you, Father Zach. So um, at the start, you mentioned that one of the reasons for why there's such a decline in sacramental marriage is that a lot of Catholics are marrying outside of the church. And um, especially in a modern society or where we live where, to quote from Seinfeld, if 95% of the population is undateable mm -hmm. because they're <laughs> <reference>. not Catholic, um, <laughs> why would you advise us or what are the benefits of marrying within the church and of just taking that step. Yeah, well, I, I felt the same way when before I felt 
uh, called to be a priest as I was dating, I was worried of thinking, is there a future with this person? Where am I going to meet someone who cares about their faith or who doesn't just put in their social media profile Catholic <laughs> or a Bible verse, but then like actually living it out? And I found that very difficult at first to find. Uh, but I, uh, as I said, the, the difference truly is the grace of the sacrament and also of recognizing that together the couple shares in this mission within the church and so that they have a real ministry within the church, a real purpose. Uh, and uh, so it gives them something much more. Uh, it gives them a common good to focus on together. And it also means it can help us to uh, discern of uh, finding someone who shares similar shares the same values and to find someone uh, to marry. Now it's even, you know, it's possible for a Catholic to marry someone who's not Catholic and have that married in the church and to have that valid through permission uh, through a bishop. And it's also possible for conversion and for people who are dating to become Catholic over time. Although we say like no missionary dating, you shouldn't date just for the purpose of converting people or hoping that they will convert. Uh, but uh, Instead, I think uh, that, uh, yeah, if uh, I, 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 and I, I am someone who loves Seinfeld, but to think, yes, it could feel like 95% of people are undateable if uh, you have it in a very secular kind of way. Uh, and certainly it didn't stop him from dating many, many, many women on the show, <laughs> never being able to be satisfied because he can't figure out how to make that true gift uh, of self. But to see that, uh, yeah, there's uh, m much more uh, uh, of uh, uh, God blesses the church with many people who have this uh, vocation to marriage and to living that out in a holy way. And if you seek that, you will can truly find that. And especially through participating in campus ministry and through life in the church after college, it's a great way to meet other people who uh, share in the faith. Great. Uh, my question is, after having written so much on uh, Pope St. John Paul II's theology of marriage. What do you think is his greatest contribution to um, our understanding of the sacrament of marriage? Uh, yeah, this is a, a great question. I, I, uh, I think that it, it is truly this sense of this living, this gift of self in truth and love. Again and again, these two words come up together, truth and love, and living love in truth. And so to see that this can't, love can't just be a word. It can't just be a feeling or emotion. And it needs to be something that's lived in truth, which comes from the truth of the dignity of the person and our response to that person. And I think this is important too, because for many people, young adults today and with emerging adults, the studies have shown that like many people, now there's not the pressure to get married, but many people create this pressure uh, of just saying there's like a point where I should be married. And so many people slide into marriage rather than decide that they like kind of fall into it. Uh, as one TV show said, like, well, this is kind of lame. It's just kind of like you just get together with a person who you're with when you happen to have like the right career and the right uh, apartment or something. And you're like, yes, if that's what you're doing, if you're just saying, uh, as marriage has changed from a cornerstone of building a life together to a capstone of what we do once everything is together in my life, uh, and then it just becomes like, then uh, it's not going to truly satisfy us and give us a foundation that we desire, the solid foundation, the house built on the rock. Instead, it needs to be built on that reciprocity, the sincere gift of self that creates a common good, that creates reciprocity behind, between the couple so that they're united not only in the love of God, but also in yeah, that reciprocal gift. Thank you for uh, sharing your wisdom tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, my question is, like, what would... Catholic counsel be around the discernment and the dating process? Like, if you wonder if you could speak a little bit to that. Sure. I, I think that 
it would be to, uh, as I've said, one thing is working on our own personal maturity and like growing in our capacity for self-gift, which can come in many ways through our studies, through our work, and through our friendships. And then to, uh, to date with that sense of get, truly getting to know a person and to see if uh, a friendship is possible with them, to see if uh, that you share a common vision and that you are starting to experience the person with within you like of uh and it's okay to date people and to say this isn't the right person that's okay or like we could be friends but uh we're not meant to uh build a whole life together and to start a family together but as you uh date and as you discern and to say do we see the same thing is am i already experiencing a unity of mind and heart with this person before the physical uh and then wanting to solidify that by being united in the love of God and through the physical. But often we do it the, the opposite way, where it can start with just a physical attraction and a physical union and then trying to justify it later, and it just it doesn't work. Now, it doesn't mean the physical attraction is bad. Sometimes people are like, they know lust is bad, so then they're like, okay, should I not be attracted uh, to this person? No, this is good, like you should. We need that. It's meant to, attraction's meant to draw us out of ourself. But if it stops there, whereas he says it's the raw material for love, but it's not yet love itself. It needs to be built on a stronger foundation than just attraction. It needs to be built on love as a virtue, on the gift of self, on reciprocity and the common good. And then with that, yeah, everything else. So I think I would just en encourage with that of to pray also, God, how are you calling me to grow in holiness and to give of myself uh, for the good of others and for the church. Because every vocation is personal. You're not just called to be a priest, but to a priest of a particular diocese or to a particular religious order or religious community. You're not just called to marriage in general, but you're called to marriage to a specific person. I know as I first started uh, discerning being a priest, I said, okay, God, I will do this if this is your will. I'm praying and all signs you're giving me are saying marriage. I'm like, but I just met this lovely woman at a young adult group. I would be open to marrying her if it's your will. And then God gave no signs of that. And then I was like, okay, that's pretty clear. Uh, and also it, that it takes two, that in that the discernment, you need two people. If the two people agree, <laughs> then you can have a marriage. Uh, but all, the same way with a priest, I don't just say, make me a priest, but the diocese has to agree, the religious community needs to re agree, or they might say, we've discerned you don't have this vocation. And so, but as I saw many of my, some, or some of my classmates who are great guys, but they uh, discerned out of being a priest, but during those years of seminary, they grew in their capacity for gift of self. So soon after, they were able to date in a much better and healthy way because they weren't dating in that selfish way before, but now they have, had learned through a daily life of prayer in the seminary how to better give of themselves for the good of the other. Okay. Here you go. Thank you, Father. Um, just to sort of build upon the previous question, I was just wondering, because you stressed about how before you go into marriage, the most important thing is you know your own weakness, and then you know the other person's weakness. But how much of your own weakness and the other person's weakness should you know to know that you're ready? <laughs> right. And, and has there ever been um, an occasion where you turn someone away from marriage? You're like, you guys shouldn't do this. <laughs> right. Uh, great, yeah, Thank great you. question. Thank you for that. And so, I, I think as much as as we can with ourselves, and also through dating and through our relationships, we'll come to learn more about ourselves because we'll say, "Whoa, I'm feeling jealous. Where did that come from?" Or I see myself. I, I really love this person, but now I'm feeling annoyed at them. What do I do with that? And like, do, am I able to be forgiving? And and so we get to come to know ourselves in that way. And then we can start seeing, oh, I need to work on this. I need to be more reliable. I need to better like return phone calls. I need to like whatever it is like it, this can happen through dating that draws we should draw the good out of each other. We should this is what uh in the jeweler shop uh Christopher says like one thing is important uh is it like is it creative? 
is what he says. We're like, is it life-giving in the relationship? Is this life creative in this relationship? Is it helping me to become a better person? And am I helping the other to become better? And so growing in that. And then knowing our own weaknesses. What, I, what he means by that is, yeah, you don't need to know everything, but in that sense of you're not marrying an ideal and you're not uh, trying to hide things from, uh, from the other person. Uh, so, yeah, there might be things from the past that you don't need to get into, uh, but there's also that openness that comes uh, in time and truly sharing uh, and accepting those things. And this is something in marriage preparation, it's asked of the couple before they get married, is there anything that you're hiding from uh, your fiance that if they knew it, they might not marry you? And this is important because it's what you want, we want is a valid marriage and we want them to be able to tell those things uh, and to be, uh, be open and uh, to have real communication. Uh, thankfully for me, I have never had to tell people not to get married, but I have warned about some of these things. Uh, if, for example, somebody was, uh, one of the spouses or fiancés was hiding an addiction and they said, well, I'll just get it under control by the time we're engaged or I'll just get this under control by the time we're married. And, uh, but it's not going to work like that, like that it, it's, the devil wants to keep it in the darkness, but the more it's brought to light, that's where true healing comes from. And so that's what I encourage them. Don't hide it and, and think, but instead be, or be, if I tell my fiance, I tell my boyfriend or girlfriend this, they're going to reject me. It's so much better in healing to not be rejected and to instead be able to be strengthened with the support and prayers of them and, and getting the help. So that's it. But it's only like when, in my ex experience, it's been that. Or, like, if uh, uh, John Paul II says a priest could, like, refuse to marry the couple if they truly had no interest in doing what the church wanted. They don't have to be saints. They don't have to be perfect Catholics in order to get married. But if they have no desire to come together freely, faithfully, uh, um, totally and fruitfully, if there's some, something in that where they're really rejecting it, uh, then, then they can... And, tell them not to get married or not yet and to better prepare for it. Thank you. Well, I will certainly answer more questions after this, but thank you all for being here. And